Today's lecture is on the Romanesque architecture in the early days of Paris as a major medieval city. We're going to back up for a little bit just to sketch some of the, the language of architectural history that leads up to this point. So I brought in two models of <clears throat> the buildings from the era that aren't part of Paris, but explain kind of the properties of major broad issues that happens between um, the celebrated era of classical antiquities and the Christian era of early Christian architecture to Byzantine, to the Romanesque, and eventually to the start of the grandiosity of Paris itself with the Gothic. So uh, the first one I'm going to show you here is what most people perceive as a medieval-esque type of building, the, the castle, the warfare, the defense mechanism, where you cloister internal living aspects and then have a a series of turrets or towers that will protect the enclave on the inside. This is a restored building from the Middle Ages called Pierrefonds outside of Paris, about an hour. It was restored by the same architect who restored uh, Notre Dame, Villa de Duc. So the uh, crenellation of this, the defense mechanisms are all based on warfare at the time. And obviously in the early days of the Christian era, it was still a very rural community and uh, People were divided by nation states and um, principalities and kingdoms and warfare was always on the horizon. So that sort of um, very muscular masculine effort of defense is important in the language of a good degree of architecture that are seminal works from that time period. Equally important are the ecclesiastical growth of the Christian faith and how they were housed in um, cloisters and abbeys and monasteries, this being Fontenay Abbey, which is also um, within a half day's drive outside of Paris, which shows again a cloistered environment with different parts of its system then brought with the language that is borrowed from the structural promise of Roman architecture and the expansive knowledge base of builders moving into more of religious uh, organization for the themes. So what's going to be common is going to push us towards our subject for today is in this particular case, we have the celebratory ecclesiastical space for the actual sacraments over here in the high bay nave. So coming from its western entrance, it has the same type of party we're going to see in many, uh, many different types of systems here. So for instance, there will be the central nave with the side aisles, with a major portal in the front, which carries you along the length of the nave toward the, the, the sacristy in the back and the cruciform plan where at this point then the high altar delivers those sacraments. On the back side of that is more of the, the um, sanctuary for the monks from this uh, Benedictine Abbey at the time that would build um, their language of faith based in their organized parade of ideas here at Fontenay. So with that in mind, we're going to move toward our subject here and talk about the principles inherent at the key building we're going to start with, which is sort of a precursor to the first big age. So we will title this as the period in case we're going to look at today. So we need to write down the language of this. So it's based on Roman building techniques and Roman systems of architecture and structural principles. So if we start with that word Roman and add in the manner of or esque, you have a period that loosely runs between uh, the latter part of the early Christian, really all the way up to the start of the Gothic era. And all those are really inscribed. And if you sort of write those out quickly from the early Christian, To the Romanesque, and eventually we'll end up with uh, Notre Dame later in the course. 
these ideas are all then part of a broader type of term for this period of time, which takes us from the classical antiquities through the Middle Ages or the medieval. The medieval then is a, a term that really kind of floats again between these years about 600 in the, in the uh, Christian era to about 1400 that runs right up into the Renaissance in, in Florentine Italy. Romanesque has been applied to the art and architecture of the 11th and 12th centuries because the Western European structures of the period utilizes forms such as the rounded arches and thick masonry wa uh, walls that are consistent with those of the ancient Roman Empire. So that's the term we're gonna to apply today to our subject, which is one of the oldest existing buildings from that era in Paris. And we'll title that up top here. Saint-Germain des Prés. So we'll first look at it as a plan type. So I'll move into pencil stock here to start to articulate that. Some of the things we're gonna look at is this is really sort of emblematic of thousands of churches that were built during the Middle Ages. Many served as stops for pilgrims who'd go on their journeys to visit the holy sites. The structures would be in the Basilica plan, which I just mentioned with the plan type of Fontenay. And then there's new structural developments. So stone masonry vaulting, barrel and groin vaulting, the ambulatories, radiating chapels, so that there was a way to walk around the apse to visit the relic, relics of all sacred objects. So it's a way for the community in the Middle Ages to see their faith firsthand, because you have to remember at this time period, most people were illiterate. They didn't read for knowledge. They actually traveled to find uh, the images of their faith. So in the case of Saint-Germain-de-Prés, it was originally a Benedictine abbey on the site uh, around the sixth century. And what we'll see on the direction of the church proper, if we start with the core nave here, again, it's sort of a tripartite where you have the long nave itself and then side aisles, which would come to a crossing in the church. And then at the back, the apse, which you know, the ambulatory rock will walk around. And what happens over time then is the original piece is built, the first basilica, which is uh, crowned by what we'll sketch over here in three dimensions a little bit. It housed the relics of St. Vincent and then Saint-Germain, the Bishop of Paris, who was buried there in 576. So it dates back pretty the beginning of this whole period of, of uh, the Romanesque and architecture. And so the ideas are going to change from what's residual from that time period to how they modernized it and clarified it and became more contemporary as they built more options to their monastery here. So for instance, in the late 13th century, the architect added the Lady Chapel over here, as well extended the apse and the ambulatory in the back to a more Gothic type of aspect to it. So the language of this, like we, we will see in the plan type of Notre Dame and other churches moving forward is most likely going to be found on an east west axis. This is done true to the map of Paris now. So a lot of times the configurations of streets and systems of the city kind of shifts that axis from being true cardinal points. But in general, the promise of the idea of the church is to, again, create the theatrics of the religion. So if Christ is the light of the day and your day revolves around the Christian mass, in the morning when the sun rises on the celebratory part where the faith base see the sacraments, it rises and then sets on sort of the urban place out in front to the west. So the people enter from the west and they leave the darkness of the earth, so to speak, to the rising sun to the east. 
And so that then comes to the crossing point where we see the high altar and the change between public access and dominion, sort of the private access of the clergy in the sort of interior chambers of that back part of the apse. So then secondary types of ideas would emanate from the sides with supporting peers to let the space fly up as vertical as possible. And then we'll see here on the app side, they radiate on the diagonal to create these secondary chapels. So outside the main nave of the church, there are small diminutive types of places for prayer to see the different relics from the, the ages of the Paris version of Christianity. During the revolution, later on in the 1700s, um, contrarian to the faith-based, they would demolish the types of Christian relics to get people to be less tied to the church, more tied to sort of human rights and developments in the enlightenment. So a lot of the original ideas of the entire campus that we're gonna sketch into now with the Romanesque ideas were lost. And what we'll see today in the sketch we'll do on the right is sort of the residual aspect that's been saved over time and now is um, readily restored on a, a basis to make sure they solidify the history of Paris. So other features about this, the symbol of that plan type. So if you sort of orchestrate this a little bit more, these are actually more the mural quality with punched openings. And this being more high Romanesque, we'll see less windows and a more mural quality. And what probably is the most original feature of the church proper is its bell tower. And that's a massive singular tower on the western end, which rises up and then rings up above to the the daily call to mass. And so that sort of bastion up there shows the more fortified aspect of it, which we'll draw over here a little bit three-dimensionally to show its, its relationship to the contemporary street of San Germain Boulevard, which actually cuts into some of the work that was done on site here to again, diminish the properties of San Germain as the new city builds around it. So similar to this then is the movement of time. So you have the earliest part, sort of the mid stage and then the youngest part that was put in in the 14th century uh, by um, Pope Alexander, started in 1163 and kind of wrapped up some of the development by the latter part of the 1300s. So the campus itself is really a series of um, the village idea for the faithful. So if you're running a monastic close in the Benedictine Abbey, you'd have all your devices for um, growing in a bit of a, a, a almost like urban agriculture of today, as well as the bounty of quiet thought, the servitude toward God, toward um, the reflection of the faithful. And so basically along the, the axes for these, you'd have commitments of the relationship to the nearby village where Paris is, is growing into a larger city, but certainly not the prominence it has later on within a, a century or two. So there are some key aspects where as the sun moves along that you hold that axis and off of that comes a series of bar shaped buildings. At this end coming off of this axis, there's sort of a garden for reflection. We can see all the principles are really based on very strong axial patterns within the language of planning as if this is a small urban plan and the streets are actually walking paths between different parts of the Benedictine Abbey. It's a little small chapel that's built later on it is more like the Saint Chapelle that we did in the initial program sketch, where it's a singular space called the Lady Chapel done by the same architect that rehabbed the back end of the church on the east side. His name was Pierre de Montreuil. So if we keep sort of sketching out the back side here, there are different aspects that share different parts and components of that monastic life and order system. But all they had to work with then what was actually established in terms of the coding of structure and what the physics of architectural design was like, because this is well before professional practice where you draw things out 
in a small scale sketch. And then you do calculations with mathematics today with computers and you solve equations and prove the performance before you out and build. Back then, it was the trades and the guilds and simply everything was on site drawn full scale. And then you would cut the stonework and then employ systems to raise that stone off the ground to create the structure. And it was really trial and error until the knowledge base got passed on in terms of what would work and what could work. And even at that point, there still were massive failures from time to time in terms of trying to reach further and further off the face of the earth. So if we just do a little bit more, the, the projection here where the original status for this before the revolution and sort of modernism took over the site extended about this proportion away from um, the, the main structure of the Saint-Germain directly. And it kind of kicks out to the West End about this dimension. And the rest really continues on with this idea of a variety of celebrated green spaces for the thought process within the faith-based to their housing, the performance of the servants they might've had that would help reap the bounty and prepare the meals. And so it worked like a little, almost a university setting where everything was sort of centrally controlled. So we can extend that language as it reaches away from the principal Saint-Germain proper. So a word about the, the image before we jump into the, the sketch over here is um, the promise of lifting stone off the earth. And so we've had since time of memoriam, the idea of structure being, if this is the base of the ground and we're looking at an elevation of how you want to create space, it's really taking from nature itself where we see the structure of a tree having a shaft to it. And then at some point, the tree breaks out and creates horizontal branches. And then if two trees are in a forest together and the branches kind of share a space, in a sense, we're creating an interior under, undercarriage beneath those trunks of the trees. So we've got sort of the, the center line of that column, the center line of that column, and the import of having some type of horizontal member, which is probably smaller than the width of this, that carries between them. And so we've got sort of the principle of thousands and thousands of years of architectural design where we're lifting material off the face of the earth to create enclosure. So the gamesmanship of that then is about the structural integrity of the columns themselves and then what this particular piece and the material can hold with a loading system here. So those in structure classes know that's the load to a real simple diagram of the beam put under duress. Because what's happening here now in, in really small detail is if this is a wooden or a steel or a concrete member, the force is coming down and it's really trying to break that and make it bow in space. So it's separating the bottom part. So it's pulling apart in tension. It's like trying to take a rubber band and stretch it longer. So a rubber band's tensile. So when you're done stretching it, it returns to its old shape. Most materials aren't that tensile. And if you try to stretch them, they fail and break. At the top part of the beam, it's actually compressing the material. So two diametric things, this is trying to pull it apart. And then nature's trying to push that together all in the same materials. There's a lot of mechanics happening within that system as the old adage is, an arch never sleeps. What the Romans then devise is the system that really you're limited in terms of space in between columns by the power of that horizontal member and its limitations. They realize that you could take a similar space and instead of having a flat piece, now draw a full circle And then not dropping in the bottom part of the circle and coming down, now with that Roman arch, that hemispherical arch, you could then hypothetically have taller spaces or wider spaces with larger arches, which would then give the ability to do larger, broader volumes of spaces for the interior environment you're trying to celebrate. 
And so that's where one of the greatest features that's borrowed in Christian culture is when they learn from the Roman and create Romanesque architecture, which we'll see in certainly the very front door we do to the access to the tower, which was added on in a later century, where in the tower proper, the openings are Roman arches. So that's our segue into the tower proper, which again is the, um, that first basilica in the sixth century, this is the last remains of it, because obviously over generations and hundreds of years, there's always a need to modernize and get broader and larger for the abbey first, for the, the peoples coming from the village, and then eventually the sake of being contemporary. So what we're going to do here using these tick marks is just sort of build out the simple procedure of finding the perspective of this tower. So our view is going to be from contemporary Boulevard in Saint-Germain, which now encroaches, oh, I'd say a little bit closer to the church proper, maybe somewhere in this line. So some of the property was lost to the redefinition of the urbanism of Paris under Baron Haussmann in the uh, 19th century. Uh, and that's the time when this is post-revolution. And so they're clamping down on the, the rights and the domain of the Catholic church at the time. So they're sort of squeezing out that out of the celebration in French society. And at the same time, they know they have to hold on to their heritage. They didn't demolish all buildings. Even Notre Dame was under siege in a sense from the public at the time, but then eventually they realized they were going to have to save their architectural heritage. So the new boulevard now is very close to Saint-Germain. So we're going to look from basically across the boulevard to the corner of this tower and plan. And we'll be able to sort of drop the church behind it to the right. To the right. So our, our first aspect is just try to find the bulk of the tower proper, which supports the bell tower up top. And so the, the key aspect here for us will be right about this point with that dark line as we draw that straight down to our baseline. And then at the top of that, imagine this being a tall box, we're simply going to make um, two vanishing lines from this point back down to our horizon line, which is where we're standing at five feet off the ground. So as this comes down to the ground, there's a horizontal line where we are looking up at this tower. So that's the ground itself. That marks a five and a half foot piece. So we're giving sort of scale to this. And now in all perspectives, we know that any orthogonal box will have two points that vanish back to the horizon line, the left vanishing point and the right vanishing point. And so in this case, if we go from this corner through this little diagonal tick mark here, that's our little cheat line to get back to the left vanishing point. Same is true to the other side. This one will fall off your page, but it will start at that same corner and go through this little tick mark and then be down to the right. Now, obviously the tower doesn't go all the way down to the horizon line to our point. It stops after a certain point because the tower is, is recognized as a symbol to create a prowess or a, a thrust of idea that's connecting the heavens and the earth. And so that vertical thrust up there is an urban gesture. So seen from miles away as the, as the people who are in their um, chartered path to see the sacred relics of the Christian faith are making their way to Paris and they see the Tower of Saint-Germain to see those relics. And so that's part of the spiritual way to get connected with the process. So that tower itself, the base then comes down at these corner points which shape the angle from the top of the front corner. And so typically in perspective of a box, you're allowed to see two faces, the left and right face. You can't see the bottom face underneath because that's in the grade and you can't see the top because you're standing on grade. So there are ways with, um, well, if you're, if you're looking at something like, for instance, from a skyscraper looking down on Saint-Germain, you'd be able to see the top as well, the two sides and the top. But the bulk of Paris is really from the street looking up to it. So we'll continue with that. Now, rather than drop the two sides straight down parallel to this, um, in perspective, there also is the idea that we're looking in three dimensions, and we call them two-point perspectives because the two points dominate. And when the buildings are shorter, we really treat this, the verticals all as parallel to each other. But because this is a tower, there actually is a third point in play because it's got a soaring quality to it. 
So rather than drop down the sides completely vertical, we're going to assume there's another point way off the page of the top, which is going to make the sides cant out a little bit. So it's draw it straight down so you know where the straight is in the scheme, but then flare it out a little bit. And that's really how the human eye sees this more and then makes the tower soar more. But it's the, the two lines are parallel in space, but because of the way perspective works, we see them converge at a point way off the page here. And that then becomes a three-point perspective. So then what we'll do is we, we also realize that when they're building stone and these massive, these are mural walls, very thick stone to get to this height because they were really novices in building vertical structures like this. So they simply probably overbuilt with a lot of masonry. As they built up, um, they realized that another way to support this is as you take a piece of stone that you could carry here and you bring it up to this point, that distance now of gravity working on that makes it exponentially more difficult for the stone that's up here. So the idea that much like here, nature is trying to make the structure fail. Now nature is with gravity here is trying to make the, the structure move out and, and force it to fail one way or another. So they realized that if they took the architecture and at certain points added buttressing to that, so the, the walls at the base actually get with attached buttressing to it on both sides. And we'll kind of hide the one behind the, the later buildings that got built next to it. But on one side, you can see at the base, what they're trying to do is use the idea that nature's best form of structure has always been the triangle. Because the triangle, it's ultimately the most rigid because one side can't fail unless the whole structure fails. And so it's more inherently rigid as opposed to a square where it can fail readily just by shifting it by coming the parallelogram. So if you can inherit the idea of pyramidal formwork in orthogonal architecture, it has more strength to it and um, lasting quality. So the walls taper out a bit at the base. Now on top of that sits uh, the actual housing for the bells themselves. So using that same perspective, we'll cant this out a little bit. And over on this side, it kind of comes down to here and that rises up to a point. And it, it, it might not be directly on top of this line, but it's pretty close to that since it's all lined up in plan type. And so that's the housing. These two lines will come to that left point and the right point off the page. So we really get a sense already that we're really underneath this tower looking up to it. And then to give it a little bit of setting down the base here, coming up this left point at our feet level, so this is our eye height, we take that point back to the left point. So there's a little bit of an angle of the base here and the same is true going back that way. And so now it feels like it's sitting on the paper and there's a base to this paper here and the tower rises up and then finally the crenellation up top is to protect the interior inside these walls. So obviously there's a conical roof to it. So I've got the top of that peak there. We can simply drop that down. And then it's got a little bit of four little corner pyramidal things that kind of anchor the corners of this. And then it's got facets. So it's not just a four-sided. And finding the top obviously is a Christian structure. It's got a cruciform shape. And again, because that's a diagonal that's in an orthogonal plane here, that will go back to the same vanishing point. So the, cro the, the, the crossing arm of a crucifix being oriented to match this east, west, north, and south, that line is parallel to that line, parallel to that line, parallel to that line. So they all have to go to one point. Now we're going to use our um, Roman arches to lighten the structure. Because one way to go taller is as you build, open up the spaces here so there's light. And so basically you're shifting the least amount of weight to the top of the structure and the most to the base. So that's in a sense also a pyramidal idea. So right in the center above, we'll actually build the uh, 18th century portal here in a little bit. 
we're right above that in the center of this, we've got very large arch. That celebrates the two story space that comes back here for the main nave. And the next one is the upper chancel of that same nave. So that's the height of the church going back. It kind of stops right here. And there are two large Romanesque arches. Because the bottom of them is a horizontal line, the bottom will come back to the left vanishing point. And the bottom will come back to the left vanishing point over here. So they're not they're parallel in real life, but they're never parallel in a drawing. It's the optics of perspective that was actually articulated into the science of drawing in the Renaissance as a way to design architecture and look at it. And it ended up in paintings and well, so that you see the ability to draw a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional piece of paper. So above that, then to make it a lighter weight structure, as you get to the next, the tower itself, and now you really want to make it more diaphanous, there are twin arches up here. And then the biggest arches are obviously to let the sound out as well with the baffles on top of it. So there's two large arches where the bells are up in the tower. All four sides, so we see two of the sides. And we can draw those in. So we'll wrap around and do the same thing over here. So this comes up and then vanishes back that way. So now we find the height of that arch as well. Bring that down and its base. And now we'll see a very little bit of this before we get to that 19th century addition. So coming up and over, we'll see the top of this arch. But I believe that will, that'll be truncated by the growth of more architecture in the front plane here. So now we, um, we've got these bastions on the outside, these sort of um, more structural integrity here. We're gonna line up here and step down line up on this side, that side. We'll step out a little bit wider, come to this point, and that's the widest step. Come over here, there is a bigger block on the eastern end, which steps away from the tower we drawn, and that comes straight down to the ground, but again, it'll be eclipsed by a building we'll draw on the front here. There's a little round turret up here. And now we'll do, because this is the, the key piece that's left from the original saint germain de pre now the things we're gonna draw that are the current there for what's been added to it and then remains from the uh, 19th century is the big um, portico, which is a triangular piece out front here, sort of almost like a, a Roman triumphal arch that drops down to the grade and then to enter the actual facility now is a very large inscribed arch that takes you into the church proper on Rue Bonaparte, which is now um, celebrating Napoleon Bonaparte and then connects, um, connects uh, Saint-Germain-de-Pre down toward the river and passes by the Ecole de Beaux-Arts on the Rue Bonaparte. So we'll then take from the corner of this and we'll pop up off of the left vanishing point here, a two, two and a half story structure, considering that there's actually space in the roof frame itself. So it's got a pitched roof. The top of that pitched roof is also vanishing back to that left point. So the points are always in play here as long as we're working horizontal. And then it's truncated by a wall which faces Saint-Germain. So that wall comes down to about this point and then that wall vanishes top of that over to the right comes down and drops and so this big plinth out front here is kind of the termination now where they actually sort of truncated this building to put the boulevard in next to this whole uh, complex of buildings then there's some secondary buildings behind here and kind of finish off the composition a little bit we'll put more value into it later on and then uh, about mid-section of the tower, 
Remember I said that the nave rises in the middle section here. So we see through the bell tower into the nave, the height of that kind of runs up to the top of these second arches. So right beyond that space is the roof line that covers the whole nave going back into the body of the church. And so that's a key feature later on to show the west to east movement back deep into the site. And then at this corner right there, it shows the length of the nave where we come to the crossing. And that crossing also is a great sort of symbolic gesture in that if we look at this and rotate the plan now to honor this cruciform shape that we sketched up here, this actually then is that heroic symbol of the Christ died on because you're using the body of Christ as the symbol of the faithful so that the people in the public aspect up here are the faithful that are the legs of the church and the transit and the workings of it day to day. They then come into the body of the church and then right at the crossing of the arms, the transept, which breaks the church into two parts, we have the working body. Then we have the head of Christ or the clergy or the intellectual part of it in the more sacred part on that side of where the sacraments happen. And the sacraments happen on the high altar then um, beneath the major part of the nave. And those are spiritually then the heart and soul of the church. So that kind of diagram and plan is yet another way to speak to people who are reading about this, but they're hearing stories in the Bible. So, so orally, they see them through the relics when they travel, they see them in sculpture in stained glass systems, and it becomes more and more ornamental as the success of architecture develops. So now to add value here, we'll just simply come into the church and kind of assign uh, a light source. And we're lucky in this particular view because we have choices of either the southern side, which receives light or day, or the western side, which receives less light in the morning, but the most light later in the day. And so we'll use the west as the key uh, segment here. And so our, our aspect here is to cloak the non um, sunny side, the, the less bright side, with a wash of gray or a light a light uh, sketch of the pencil so that we pull the drawing off the page through a change of value. So we'll simply start with a wash at the top and then take all that side and stage by stage and bring that down until it hits this part, which then comes beyond the tower and faces west so that will receive light but wrapping around to the right on the boulevard face, which is now simply, it's got a couple of punched openings to it, but it really is a truncation of this form. So it really is a great place that Paris just grows ivy on. So it's a dark volume of tone there. We take that down to grade. So that little bit there, I think performs and shows a little bit more of a uh, three-dimensional volume on the piece of paper to make that work well. Now we'll come back in and we'll do a little more detailing to show the depth and promise of these openings because we've done them in line, but really to show the depth of the actual architecture, we wanna come back in and show a second line because then we see the thickness of the material as well. Do that for all the arches. Particularly up here where the bell top are very, very deep. And we see, by the way, it's constructed up there, uh, just, just how diaphanous the space is. So it almost by the time you get to the tower top, it's actually more opening than it is actual structure. And then the Gothic plays off of that and makes architecture more and more delicate. So the Romanesque is learning from a prior realm of architecture. The Gothic then takes those systems and, and drives them further and further up so that the spectacle of moving like this is not just in the tower, it's in the actual nave itself. So for instance, in the Gothic cathedrals, the naves will be much larger than the entire tower of Saint Germain. So to um, kind of move towards some definition now, we'll take from the west light to get to our entry, the light will come down and cast a line into that. So the upper part of that opening is gradated. So you see an access point of pulling people in We'll take our little openings for these and make those the darkest. Because during the daytime, even if a building's lit on the inside with natural or now electric light, 
nothing is as powerful as the sun. So any type of opening will be much darker during the day. So when you come in value in basics and kind of this quick sketch here, you really have three values. You have what's being lit, what's being um, shaded, or what's on the shade side of it. And then really what's finally is if something has a cast shadow on it, it's very dark, or if it's an interior, it's very dark. And so those three points along with your line work can help sort of elucidate that three-dimensional quality of this, this street tower. The last thing here to kind of wrap up the study of Saint-Germain-de-Pré is to come back in and kind of pull out some defining lines. And in a quick sketch, the defining lines really are when the building then articulates a change in volume in the subject matter. So what happens on this line in front is on either side, we can still see the form and there's no space being held by that line, nor by that line and this corner. That one really no space is being held, it's just showing the outside realm. On the exterior though, this line, if we were to move behind it, we could disappear. It's holding space behind it. Same is true of this, same is true of this. So the ones that actually have got more definition to show movement of something behind the line, that's when it has to be darker. Down. This will be dark because there's a space behind that. This one has an edge, that one has an edge. And just that little bit of attention then starts to give us an idea of depth beyond what the perspective allows. So in concert, the value with the perspective makes this more and more three-dimensional. So our, our scheme here then for Saint-Germain-de-Pré is, is a system of advices that French architecture didn't necessarily invent. What French architecture will sort of claim now is the Romanesque as their foundation. And then from those principles of what they learned about the mechanics of structural design in this, this age of uh, stone ecclesiastical and residential architecture, is the growth and the knowledge base that would be passed down by generations of, of guildsmen to eventually ascend to the heights of the Gothics and the dreams of the bishops that see their enclave as being superior to others. So much like there's always competitive spirits for industries and contemporary corporations, back then there was a, there was a competition to be taller, thinner, and lighter to make a greater piece of prose about the change of the culture when you walk into an ecclesiastical space is no longer earthly, it's of the heavens. And so if you can reduce the masonry out here and make the skin more glass than that, which we'll see in the next upcoming plates, uh, the architecture becomes much more diaphanous and birdcage-like, and then the sun becomes a major player inside the space itself. As opposed to here, when you walk in the front third, even today, after restoration, you'll see this is very dark here with very little windows. This from Romanesque is also very dark with punched openings. And now here with the early Gothic, the same time Notre Dame has started, you've got a whole lot more proportion of glazing to the structure. So it's lighter weight. And so in keeping with the church, it still has a very early Romanesque feel to it because the height is consistent throughout. When you move into the early Gothic, the whole prominent is not so much to make a bigger floor plan, to make a taller space on top of the floor plan. And that's where we're headed next with the early Gothic in Notre Dame.